By the middle of the 1990s, Sega and Nintendo had pretty much dominated the home console market between them. Other companies tried to muscle in and eat away at their market share, but the old guard stood firm and managed to retain their market lead. The originator of home video games had been well and truly usurped and would fail to break any new ground on the industry it established. But as things change, they largely stay the same as well. Between them both, Sega and Nintendo had managed to shift almost 100 million consoles a feat that was considered to be impossible even just 10 years ago. Would anyone else be able to get a piece of the lucrative gaming market? A new challenger would step up and begin to lay siege to the two powerhouses of home video games. It would establish itself as a credible alternative to the competition and eventually take its place as the market leader. It would shift the focus away from conventional 2D sprite based gaming and established brands would reinvent themselves in a new 3D based world full of texture mapped polygons and revive the fortunes of older, forgotten classics. As before, new heroes would emerge and take gamers on new adventures in unexplored lands and introduce gamers to new genres and scare them silly. It would finally achieve something that no other games machine before has been able to achieve and become the very definition of what's cool in the 90s. This era is what I like to call the PlayStation era of the golden age of video games. Thank <laughs> you.
With the fifth generation of video games machines stuttering along, it would be up to the main players Sega and Nintendo to really get the party going. With nothing else worth reporting on the Jaguar, 3DO or Ultra 64, the press spent the first few months of 1995 following the birth pangs of the PlayStation and Sega Saturn. At the start of the year, there was no telling which of the two would end up in the driving seat. There was very little software available to base a decision on, and all the information that was available was that Sega Saturn had Virtua Fighter, and the PlayStation had a fancier but less cool 3D beat-em-up called Toshinden. The next major releases were both driving games. Daytona USA on the Sega Saturn and Ridge Racer on the Sony PlayStation. The two machines seemed to be matching each other blow for blow, but it was still anyone's fight. As the year went on and official launch date approached, the Sega Saturn started to pull ahead. Sega's own arcade heritage was serving it well when it came to providing Saturn software, and Sega announced more sharp-looking coin-op conversions. Virtua Fighter 2, Virtua Cop and Sega Rally all looked fantastic, and Capcom was also releasing its latest Street Fighter-style fighting game, X-Men Children of the Atom. X-Men was able to demonstrate the Saturn's abilities to deliver arcade-perfect ports of 2D fighters, something which the PlayStation would struggle with during its run. X-Men Children of the Atom looked impressive, not least as Capcom had been using this unique anime graphic style in their fighting games as of late, with Street Fighter Alpha sporting this cartoon appearance which tied in with the release of the Street Fighter 2 anime as well. The release of the animated version of Street Fighter helped remove the horror from gamers' minds that was Street Fighter the movie, but even worse was to come when Capcom decided to release a version of the game based on the digitised versions of the live actors, kind of like Mortal Kombat. So we had Street Fighter the game based on a movie that was based on a game. Confused? Anyone? Anyway, as expected, this was utter garbage and quickly sank without a trace. Meanwhile, the PlayStation looked distinctly underfed as far as good games went. Apart from Tishinden and Ridge Racer and another 3D beat-em-up from Namco called Tekken, there were only a couple of owned arcade conversions, Cyber Sled, and the Raiden project, neither of which were remotely spectacular. Sega of Japan, keen to keep a hold of the lead in terms of sales and market share, hurriedly pushed through the release of the Sega Saturn in the USA and Europe. In the States, the Sega Saturn was penciled in for a release date of September the 2nd, which would cause a promotion called Saturn Day. Oh, for goodness sake. But, at the first ever E3 Expo in Los Angeles on May the 11th, 1995, the SEGA CEO, Tom Kalinske, gave a keynote presentation in which he revealed the Saturn's release price of $399 US dollars and described the features of the console. Kalinske also revealed that, due to high consumer demand, Sega had already shipped 30,000 Saturns to Toys R Us, Babbage's, Electronics Boutique and Software etc. for immediate release. This announcement upset retailers who were not informed of the surprise release, including Best Buy and Walmart. KB Toys responded by dropping Sega from its lineup completely. This hurried and unexpected launch in the States also meant that third-party developers 
who were working on games for release day, were not ready. The only titles available were in-house developed games by Sega. The move to release early was to gain an advantage over Sony, but in reality, any early Saturn adopters had no real choice of new games until September, which was when the US release of the PlayStation was due to take place. In the UK, Sega launched the Saturn officially on July 8, celebrating the event by projecting a huge Saturn advertisement onto the walls of the Houses of Parliament in London. The launch games were Virtua Fighter, Daytona USA, and an unusual 3D blaster called Panzer Dragoon. The following month, Sega gave the Shinobi character the 32-bit treatment, although all they did was use digitised graphics and slow down the gameplay. There was no evidence of any next-gen stuff there at all. Still, it was a great machine with great software and a too great price. £400 was a bit too steep for many players liking and no matter how great the machine, most people have better things to do in the height of summer, but not me. I bought this machine on release day. I have to be honest, this was probably my first mistake I made in choosing a games machine. As I had seen this and the PlayStation on display at my import store, and when comparing the two of them, I thought the Saturn looked like the safer bet. Due to its library of arcade games, I even remember my mate asking me just before Christmas 94 which one I would go for, and I responded with this, what does Sony know about video games? I think the PlayStation will end up like the 3DO and be a flop. But within two months of buying a Saturn, I decided I would buy a PlayStation as well when Sony finally get around to releasing it. What do I know about video games anyway? The Saturn looked even more overpriced when Sony launched the official PlayStation in September, priced at only £300. It wasn't as if the low price was making up for some kind of deficiency either. Suddenly the PlayStation seemed to have acquired a wide selection of excellent games, with plenty more to come. Chief among them were two race games from Psygnosis, Destruction Derby and Wipeout. Wipeout, with its incredible futuristic graphics and music by well-known acts currently signed to the Sony record label, was quickly identified as the best game on the machine and it was reported that shortly after its launch, a copy of the game was being bought with every new PlayStation sold. Over the first three months of its official UK existence, the PlayStation was outselling the Saturn by approximately 7 to 1. Sega hurriedly dropped the price of the Saturn to £329, then by Christmas to £299. It was still a potent machine though, and many pundits still fancied it over the PlayStation, purely on the strength of its forthcoming range of cool coin-up conversions. It was still early days for both machines though, and both had a huge supply of exciting looking titles lined up for 1996. And what of the other 32-bit consoles? The 3DO had been faltering for most of 1995, with a minimal range of decent software titles, and a massive price drop from £400 to under £200 over the course of the year. Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, a classy shooter by the name of Return Fire, an electronic arts conversion of John Madden Football and FIFA Soccer were the only games worth having. At the start of the year, unhappy 3DO owners must have been cheered by news that the 3DO company were already developing its next machine, which would be available as a complete unit or as an upgrade. Bulldog, or M2 as it came to be known, 
was a 64-bit specification which 3DO claimed would beat every other home game system, including Nintendo's Ultra 64, with its almighty graphics engine, capable of enormous polygon rendering power, as well as all sorts of sophisticated 3D and colour power effects. By the end of the year, things did not seem so certain, as the 3DO company had sold the M2 specification exclusively to Matsushita Electrical Industries, leaving itself free to develop software rather than hardware. Having paid an estimated $100 million for it, there was no danger of Matsushita shelving it, but details were very scarce on when the system may appear. The future of Atari's Jaguar looked even less certain than the 3DO's. More than a year on from its launch, and it still only had two worthwhile games in its catalogue, and of those, only Doom was capable of mass appeal. Tempest 2000 was a game for arcade nostalgics and video game purists. Aliens vs Predator had turned out to be all atmosphere and not enough action and Rayman was merely a pretty platform game with subsonic action. New releases were announced, but rehashes of ancient arcade games such as Defender 2000 and Breakout 2000 were not going to do it for Atari, when Sega had Sega Rally and Sony had Tekken and Ridge Racer. The promised Jaguar CD drive did not arrive and neither did the VR helmet. By Christmas, the Jag was in a sorry state and was going for a mere £159. The wild rumours of Nintendo canning the Ultra 64 because it would be too expensive to produce were quashed when the machine was finally given its first airing at the November Shoshinaki Show in Japan. Nintendo gave the trade attendees hands-on experience of the new Ultra 64, thus proving that yes, it did exist, and yes, it was certainly the most powerful game system available. The preview also confirmed that Nintendo did intend to stick to using cartridges instead of CDs. Although there was much talk of an add-on bulky drive, which would use special 150 meg magnetic discs. Though most of the software was only visible on showreel videos, all of the games had a screen presence that was beyond anything that had been seen before. Clearly, the collaboration between Nintendo and Silicon Graphics to produce the Ultra 64's graphics hardware was paying off, and it was clear the console players would have some spectacular 3D games to look forward to, including Ultra 64 versions of some of the best loved SNES games, Pilot Wings 64, Super Mario Kart 64, Legend of Zelda 64, and best of all, Mario 64. Nintendo also announced that work on the SNES version of the long-awaited Star Fox 2 had been cancelled, in favour of Star Fox 64, which was again being produced by Argonaut Software in the UK. All looked mouth-wateringly good stuff, and Nintendo UK cleverly followed the excited magazine reports with full-page adverts showing a picture of the Ultra 64 and advising potential PlayStation and Saturn buyers that they should wait for it. The European release date at the end of 1996 was mentioned, but would it be met? The potential upgraders were definitely getting itchy feet. After all, with programmers like Argonaut Software trading in their SNES development kits for Ultra 64 models, did this mean that the old 16-bit machines were finished? The Mega Drive was definitely losing its momentum, and Mega Drive players only had a handful of good new games to choose from during 1995. Sega's Big Christmas Game, a platformer based on a hit movie Toy Story, sold well but did not have anything new apart from pre-rendered character graphics, which was what Nintendo had given Donkey Kong Country the year before. 
there was talk of Sega releasing an all-in-one Mega Drive and 32X system called Neptune in September. But apart from an excellent conversion of Virtua Fighter, the 32X had not really contributed anything to the gaming world. By Christmas, both the 32X and the Mega CD were selling at £99 a piece. The flow of SNES games also slowed down over 1995, but the machine still had some action in it. Konami's International Superstar Soccer Deluxe was hailed as one of the best football games the world had ever seen, and Rare had the sequel to Donkey Kong Country, Diddy Kong's Quest, as well as a conversion of the Ultra 64 based arcade fighting game Killer Instinct. A small company called DMA Design, based in Dundee, came up with a novel racing game called Uniracer. This was a game that showed that the SNES could match Sonic's fast-paced gameplay. Unfortunately, Disney Pixar also seen the game and sued DMA for copying the unicycle design from their 1987 short film Red's Dream. Nintendo agreed to pull the plug on Uniracer and the initial production run of only 300,000 was the only release of the game, making this game pretty collectible these days. DMA was also working on a new title for the new generation of 32-bit machines called Race and Chase that would later put the company on the map in ways they could not have imagined. Nintendo themselves had Yoshi's Island, the latest Super Mario platform game which ably lived up to its prestigious pedigree and there was a startling conversion of Doom which used the Super FX chip to recreate a game that had needed several hundred pounds worth of PC hardware the year before. There was one section of the gaming community for whom Doom was old hat though. PC owners had played the game to death and had even taken to customising it with their own level designs, new sounds and graphics. Doom was a gaming phenomenon, and when Doom 2 showed up in the spring with new levels and new monsters, it looked like the craze would continue. Suddenly, everyone was producing 3D shoot-em-ups in the Doom style, and though most of them were hurriedly produced bandwagon jumpers, some actually improved on the formula such as LucasArts, Dark Forces and Interplay's Descent. While imitators struggled to catch up, ID Software were working on a game that would set the gaming world alight once more, just as Doom had in 1994. It would be a 3D shoot 'em up more realistic and more bloody than anything seen before. And it would be called Quake. As 1995 came to a close, I took a moment to pause and have reflection. I had bought two new machines this year in the Saturn and PlayStation. I bought a few more games for my Neo Geo to beef up my collection, and I had bought a fair few SNES games as well. This should have felt like a great year, but something was missing. Somehow, just been able to see something I like and buy it without having to save up for it took some of the appeal away. When I was younger, I would read computer mags endlessly and gaze blankly into the pages of reviews and make decisions based on recommendations from those magazines. Buying a bad game back then spelled disaster. Buying a bad game now meant eh, was my digital lust no longer insatiable? Was this the beginning of the end of the love affair with video games? Or am I totally overreacting?
A lot has changed in the last 13 years or so in the world of video games. Video games have progressed from this to this. And from this to this. It was also hard to believe that it was only 13 years ago that everyone was hooked in machines that could only display a handful of colours on screen. Provide a series of beeps and boops and pass that off as a soundtrack. And it was even harder to believe that people actually thought Space Invaders and Pac-Man were both pretty good games. In those golden days of the early 1980s, even the most ardent believer in the future of video games would never have believed they would eventually be controlling full colour, photorealistic three-dimensional characters in the comfort of their own homes. Yet, in 1996, that was just the position many gamers found themselves in. The new breed of consoles and computers provided a platform that allowed programmers and game designers to write the games they always wanted to. Their imaginations had room to run amok and they could now create the games all gamers, including myself, dreamed of playing. Most arcade development has always been hardware led and it has often been the technological advances that have made new coin ops exciting. Why else would anyone have played Space Harrier if not to see the fantastic graphics and ride the hydraulic chair? Now that console hardware could do almost anything a dedicated coin-op could, the emphasis had to be shifted back towards improving arcade software. Sega got to work with releasing innovative games that could really only be played in an arcade. Sega Bass Fishing was a strange fishing game that instead of joysticks you actually used a fishing rod and reel to catch and tease the fish into your boat. Sega's AM2 development team had refined the creation of beat-em-ups to a fine art and it was widely thought that things cannot get much better than Virtua Fighter 3 with its finely rendered characters and the vast array of techniques that players had to master. Still. The development of fighting games continued. Capcom, the company who revived the whole genre with Street Fighter 2, released a unique fighting game called Red Earth. Red Earth was the first game to be released on Capcom's all-new hardware and the CPS3 board featured two different game modes, a single-player quest mode and a two-player versus mode. In quest mode, the player chooses from one of the four main characters and progresses through their character's storyline while fighting against a series of eight computer-controlled adversaries in a series of one-on-one -on -one battles. Gaining experience points during each battle, which are used to improve the character's attack and defense and unlock new moves. Red Earth is also one of the few Capcom games with fatalities. They include splitting the opponent in half, decapitation, artery rupture, organ removal and limb slicing. X-Men vs Street Fighter was Capcom's attempt at a franchise crossover. The gameplay was that of a two-on-two -two fighter. You could choose two characters from either the Street Fighter universe or the Marvel Universe and participate in a series of tag battles. It was pretty popular and prompted Capcom to release more of these Marvel vs Capcom series of fighters. Capcom were also busy preparing the proper sequel to Street Fighter 2. Street Fighter 3 would have more characters and more moves than ever before the question was, would it be just as successful as its predecessor? As well as the sequel to Street Fighter 2, Capcom released two of the Alpha series onto the PlayStation, with Street Fighter Alpha in May 
and Alpha 2 in December of that same year. Both games sported an accurate portrayal of the anime style graphics and excellent gameplay, but gamers had been switched on to 3D fighters and were wondering if or when Street Fighter would make the transition to 3D. Meanwhile, Namco's Tekken team busied themselves creating Tekken 3, which they claimed would be better than Virtua Fighter 3, but gamers would have to wait until the following year to get their chance to play it. There were some terrific arcade driving games launched over 1996. Sega's Manx TT and Namco's Rave Racer among them, but some of the best racers appeared on consoles. Sega Saturn owners had Sega Rally. PlayStation owners got an even better deal when Psygnosis released Formula One. Not only was it the best console driving game, it was the biggest selling CD title up to this point and that during its first weekend on sale in the UK, 30,000 copies were snapped up by race-hungry punters. Formula One was regarded as the best racing game on any home system, though PC owners might have argued that Micro Pros's Formula One Grand Prix 2 put up some pretty stiff opposition, though either of these could be regarded as the all-time king of racing games. The title of coolest racing game ever made had to go to another Psygnosis title. Wipeout 2097 was a dream sequence in racing game form. Its hyper real visuals and awesome special effects seduced the eyes while the ambient soundtracks seemed to act on the subconscious mind until the player's autonomic nervous system became synchronised to the pulsing of the baseline. Oh yeah. PlayStation owners were not the only ones to have their senses treated though. The creators of Sega's Sonic the Hedgehog series created a Saturn game called Knights, which defied categorisation. It was a soaring trip through a surreal and beautiful 3D landscape where artificial life forms lived and died, and if you didn't bother them, made up songs. It was so different from anything else that Sega had to come up with a new control pad just so Saturn owners could play it properly. Knights, a unique video gaming experience. Sega had also been busy converting two of its hit coin-ops during 1996. Fighting Vipers and Virtua Cop 2 were released on the Saturn this year, mainly in an effort to try and curb falling sales of the console, but also to showcase the ability of the machine. Sega also released a follow-up to Panzer Dragoon, Panzer Dragoon's Vi. While all of these games were impressive, it did very little to stem the poor sales figures. By Christmas of 1996, sales of the Saturn had plummeted and only 1.2 million consoles had been sold since the machine was released in the UK. Even Sega themselves must have been scratching their heads as they tried to figure out how to turn this around. Rumours from Japan were that they had decided to focus on yet another console and this console would be developed in collaboration with Lockheed Martin or even the 3DO company. Other reports had suggested that a 64-bit Saturn II was being developed as an add-on for the Saturn. Oh, please Sega, not another add-on. Sony dropping the price of the PlayStation to around £200 couldn't have helped matters much either. Capcom had also been busy at work, not content with being the undisputed king of arcade games, and they set out to prove that they could also create original arcade adventure content. What they released was nothing short of staggering. A new genre of game had been created, and that genre was the survival horror game. 
Resident Evil was a remake of a game on the NES called Sweet Home, released in 1988. The producer, Tajuru Fujiwara, was commissioned by Shinji Mikami to develop a survival horror game as early as 1993. The game was heavily inspired by B-movies from the 1950s, along with movies by George Romero, and also the movie based on the Stephen King novel, The Shining. When the game was released, everyone was impressed, and also terrified. Capcom had managed to create a properly scary game. The chilling atmosphere was achieved by using pre-rendered backgrounds, which is why the game had fixed camera angles, along with subtle music and jump out of the seat sound effects. The game was a critical and commercial success and found its way onto almost every format available at the time, and cemented Capcom's legacy as being one of the greatest names in video game history. Delphine Software released the sequel to Flashback, Fade to Black, and this was a true 3D roaming environment to play in. The gameplay was frustrating at times due to poor controls, but if nothing else, it showed that 3D was the future of gaming, and it was possible for some 2D franchises to make a successful transition to 3D environments. Other notable releases that year were Die Hard Trilogy, Alien Trilogy, Tekken 2, Twisted Metal 2, Destruction Derby 2, and Fighting Force. Everyone had Doom pegged as one of the best blasting games ever, but when ID Software announced it was working on something better, it was hard to imagine how this was possible without some kind of trans-dimensional technology. But, at the start of 1996, PC players got their first taste of Quake in the form of a 3-level three, three test edition, and they went mad. Unlike Doom, Quake was a fully three-dimensional game, three-dimensional characters roaming the three-dimensional dungeons and carrying big three-dimensional weapons. Even the preliminary version got the old Doom crowd so excited that they constructed their own map editors, then their own maps, then their own character designs which turned their characters into Star Wars Stormtroopers and Terminators. The 8 level shareware release and the full game did not come out until September, by which time PC players were in a frenzy of excitement. In single player mode, it was 30 plus levels of eerie atmosphere and big monsters, but the best way, some would say the only way, to play Quake was against other players over a network. The same had been said of Doom when it first appeared, but back then very few players had access to a network. In 1996 though, the growing number of internet connections meant that Quake fans could log on to a remote server and conduct rocket tests on other players from all over the world. Experts agreed that this type of internet powered trans-global competition was the shape of things to come. Nintendo treated gamers to another version of the shape of things to come. When the Nintendo 64 final appeared in June, it was revealed as a staggeringly powerful machine that lived up to everyone's expectations, and no game demonstrated that better than Super Mario 64. A Mario game has always been something to celebrate. In their day, they have each been called the best game ever, but Super Mario 64 was beyond anything that fans had ever dreamed of. Mario was no longer a picture of a chubby guy in dungarees toddling around your TV screen. This time, he looked so real that you felt you could almost reach into the screen, pull him out and he'd be standing 
in the palm of your hand, grinning and blinking and scratching his moustache. The landscape Mario could explore was more than a bunch of obstacles placed side by side on a scrolling level. The player could take him anywhere in a three-dimensional world, up the hills, into secret caves and down to a submerged shipwreck. This was like no game ever seen anywhere, and reviewers were forced to blow the dust off the brook of forbidden words, and as one, they dubbed Super Mario 64 the best game ever. Another worthy contender for the crown of best game ever was Core Design's Tomb Raider. Like Resident Evil, this game had a long development cycle. The game itself featured a female protagonist, which seemed to tie in with the craze for girl power that the Spice Girls would become responsible for creating. Tomb Raider was a fully three-dimensional puzzle action game in which the player would control Lara Croft on her journey through several dungeons as she fights off bad guys, bears, tigers and even a T-Rex. And in between all of this, she was also able to solve a few puzzles and perform handstands while climbing up ledges. The game was very well received. Even if the gameplay was a little simplistic, and Lara Croft became something of a gaming icon. Needless to say, 1996 was another good year for video games, and here I still found myself a little bit wanting. Video games were beginning to give way to other interests for me, namely drinking and hot hatchbacks. As 1996 was drawing to a close, I was starting to resign myself to the fact that maybe I had simply grown out of video games. Could it be so? Many changes had taken place in the video games world since I got hooked in the early 1980s. The transition from simple 2D games to full 3D immersive games was there for gamers to see. Along this road there had been many casualties. 1996 had seen the end of a few contenders in Atari and the 3DO company, but who would be next for the digital scrapyard? As 1997 opened its doors for business, I took stock of the video game scene and decided that my Saturn, instead of just gathering dust, I would lend it to a mate. And then, I never seen it, or my mate, ever again. Thieving little. Hearing the rumours of Sega ditching the Saturn in favour of a new machine, left a sour taste in my mouth, and I could no longer trust them. But it seemed this sentiment was echoed by several hundreds of SEGA fans. As 1997 drew on, the Saturn sales figures made for some grim reading, and it was becoming clear that SEGA had put up a good fight, but ultimately it lost. This was not down to one simple error, no, far from it. Some people cite the reason for the death of the Saturn as being the early release to ship date, which caught a lot of developers off guard. But 
That would have meant that Sega knew they were going to fail. Nah. Some people even suggest the rift within Sega themselves, reminiscent of the rifts in Atari in the 80s. Japan and America Sega chiefs could not agree on the direction of the Saturn. Japan was more concerned about the threat from Atari with the Jaguar, and so decided to give backing to the 32X for the Mega Drive, which was a massive flop. But if history has taught us anything, it's this. Nobody who takes shortcuts survives in this cutthroat business. In my opinion, Sega's real downfall came from their reliance on arcade games to help boost sales of their current home machine. They failed to see the change in market trends for more involved and adult oriented gaming. Games were now no longer a mere 20 minute plaything. Gamers wanted to explore 3D worlds and be invested in games. The technology had evolved so much that it was now possible to control characters in a full three-dimensional environment. And that itself would lead to new directions and where to go in the gaming community. Nintendo realised this, and when they made the decision to make Super Mario 64 a full 3D experience, it showed that there could still be life in the old 2D ideas, but with a fresh 3D approach. I had not intended to buy a Nintendo 64, but a mate of mine who had the rich parents, he had one. But this time, the fiscal advantage he once had over me had been wiped out. I decided to buy a Nintendo 64 in January of 1997 with my bonus or profit share as it was called. And to rub salt in the wounds, I asked my mate if he wanted to tag along. So I picked him up in my Mark II Golf GTI and he drove over to my favourite import store. When I purchased a Nintendo 64, complete with Super Mario 64, Pilot Wings 64, and just because I knew he wanted a copy, I bought a copy of International Superstar Soccer 64, which cost over £100, and this was the only copy that was available in the store. As the months went on, and just because I could, I bought loads of games for the N64. Super Mario Kart 64, which was an updated version of the now SNES Classic. Turok Dinosaur Hunter, a first person shooter and my first and almost last FPS game I would ever play. GoldenEye 007, a first person game with an interesting party mode where up to four players could play against each other on the same TV, using the same console and on the same couch. This however was my last ever. FPS game, and Star Fox 64, again, another follow-up to a Super NES classic. I had never really wanted a Nintendo 64, or I never really gave it much thought until I had some money burning a hole in my pocket. And even though I was buying games for it, I was not really playing it much, which again started to make me think that I was really starting to lose interest in video games. A mate of mine had been a PC gamer for a few years now and was trying to convince me that this was the way to go. But seeing games played on a computer keyboard reminded me of kids with spectrums who had parents that were too tight to buy a joystick interface. His perseverance was contagious though and I started to play some games, mainly older titles like Prince of Persia, 
and Leisure Suit Larry. He had this one game though, which was produced by a company called SCI. This was a driving combat game called Carmageddon. In Carmageddon, the player races a vehicle against a number of other computer controlled competitors in various settings, including city, mine and industrial areas. The player has a certain amount of time to complete each race, but more time may be gained by collecting bonuses, damaging competitors' cars, or by running over pedestrians. Unusually for a racing game, checkpoints do not extend the time limit. At the time of release, the BBFC refused to give it a certification unless all the blood and gore was removed. But, after almost a year of appeals, it finally got certified and the original version was released. This game was really the first to make use of the Congressional Hearing Against Video Game Violence outcome, which happened way back in 1993. Now that games can be marketed towards adults, then games with adult content can be made. All Congress did was give the green light to developers to create violent games as long as they agreed to a mature rating system. Carmageddon, in my opinion, wasn't even a good game, but another game he had did catch my eye, and it was a game called Grand Theft Auto. GTA was programmed by DMA Design and Dundee, the same people who made Lemmings and Uniracer. The name had been changed from Race and Chase to Grand Theft Auto to signify a change in gameplay style. In nearly every game before, the main character is a good guy. Some had attitudes like Duke Nukem, but no game up to this point allowed you to take control of a character who was meant to be a villain. And no game before had ever allowed a player to make so many of their own choices in games. If you did not fancy doing a mission, you could drive around Liberty City, run a few people over, go on a mass killing spree, attack the cops, pretty much anything you wanted. This new style of gameplay would come to be known as Sandbox, and Grand Theft Auto was a master of it, and it was freaking awesome. It was karma that this game appeared when it did. I was not going to buy a PC to play this game, Pff, no way. I worked in a factory that made PCs. To use one at home would be too much of a bus man's holiday for me. But I was heartened when news filtered through magazines that it would be making its way to the PlayStation in 1998. Finally, a reason not to give up gaming just yet. In the meantime, to keep my interest in gaming going just a little while longer, I decided to busy myself by adding games to my Neo Geo collection. A small video game shop next to Central Station seemed to have a lot of used games in stock, and all for £40 or under. The shopkeeper must not have had any idea what these things were worth, and over the course of a matter of months, I bought almost every game he had. So, 
Sony made sure that their position in the marketplace was not going to be overthrown by the UK release of the Nintendo 64 and made sure they had a lot of great games out during this year. Core Design released Tomb Raider 2 on PlayStation and Windows machines. Saturn owners must have started to be getting the hint by this point. Nana on Shah released the highly entertaining and hugely popular Parappa the Rapper, a rhythm video game that went on to sell 1.4 million copies. And Namco released another updated version of Tekken, Tekken 3. Previews of a driving game that Sony themselves were working on was released. Gran Turismo was a driving game that promised to be a whole new approach to racing games. Allowing players to customise practically anything they wanted in a car. From the wheels and paint, to the exhaust and suspension. And fit whopping massive big turbos onto small shopping trolleys such as the Nissan Micra, all so they could produce 900 brake horsepower. My interest in this game was peaked, as I was firmly becoming a boy racer and so this was another game to look forward to in 1998. There was one release in 1997 on the PlayStation that would change everything for me in video games. Japanese games markets had very different tastes in games from players in the western world, and over there, role playing games were huge. Squaresoft had been working on a JRPG for Nintendo, but when the developers realised their ambition would be stifled by the N64's lack of computing space, Sony stepped in to secure a deal and the result was quite possibly the single best game ever made in the history of video games. And on the 14th of November 1997, the greatest video game ever to be made was released onto an expectant UK gaming public. Final Fantasy VII was an absolutely massive role playing game spread over three CDs on the PlayStation and the rumour was that it would have taken over 30 double D discs on the N64 disc drive unit. Squaresoft went on an absolute tour de force to advertise the game, knowing it was taking a huge risk. Magazines ran double paged adverts showing screenshots of the game, which did not look terribly impressive, and on TV the adverts showed off the low resolution cutscenes to very little fare, but the UK gaming public went crazy for this game. I must admit, when I bought my copy of the game, it was on a special deal. Buy one game, get the cheaper one half price. So Final Fantasy cost me £20, and I can't even remember what the other game was, because it simply did not get a look in. From the moment I plugged it into my PlayStation, I was gripped. The action was great, the artwork was fabulous, the little super deformed characters looked like the least threatening thing you have ever seen, but the best thing about this game over all else was the story. It starts off slowly, but like any good story, it pulled in the player little by little, till you get to the early morning and you keep saying, mm, just another five minutes till I see what happens next. Before you know it, two hours have passed. I once played this game for about ten hours without saving, which was a mistake as two of my mates had turned up and distracted me and I died. Normally, I would have been very annoyed, but with Final Fantasy VII, I just could not get enough, and replaying 10 hours of gameplay was worth it. Each time you play, the battles are different, or 
you find some hidden elixir you missed the first time around. This was also my first real experience of a JRPG and thankfully the game had this amazingly easy magic power up system and control method. Everything about this game just encouraged the player to do more and it also played with the player's emotions. So here is a spoiler alert. When Ares gets killed by Sethroth at the end of disc 1, I was fuming because I had spent a long time building up her abilities. But I was also sad, as the characters were all so likeable. The scene in the Golden Saucer, where Cloud takes Eris, then Tifa out on a date, was one of the all-time best scenes in video games. The humour between the characters was great as well, and Sethroth was a villain to rival even Darth Vader. I remember playing it around the first time and thinking I had done well. Then reading in a magazine, I noticed that at the final battle, this guy had all of his character's hit points at 9,999. I only had about 2,500, so this meant another playthrough was in order, and this time all of the side quests were done. All in, to play Final Fantasy VII, you would get about 6 months of game time, or about 100 hours. It's the best 20 quid I've ever spent. And it's safe to assume that I love this game immensely, and to this day, I have not played a game that is better, and it gets my vote as best game of all time. But at the same time, it also spelled the end of my love affair with video games. How could any game be able to match this? Would any other game truly be able to outperform Final Fantasy VII for, well, anything really? Could it be that at this moment, after 14 years of playing video games, that this was going to be the pinnacle? The zenith of gaming. Would 1998 be able to top 1997? I know what you're thinking here. What's happened to the last 23 years? Well, that is a question I often ask myself. A lot had happened in video games in those 23 years, except that it didn't. Hardware-wise, Sega tried to revive their fortunes by releasing the Dreamcast, which was a fantastically powerful machine, but it just didn't have enough to stop the momentum of Sony and the PlayStation. Sony released the PlayStation 2, which would go on to become the highest selling games machine of all time. And that was followed by the PS3, then the PS4, and now it's the turn of the PS5.
Nintendo had great success with the Wii console, which handed players a unique and novel set of controls which opened up gaming to a whole new generation, young and old. Microsoft entered the market in 2001 with the Xbox, which was really a mid-spec PC wrapped up in a games console dinner jacket. It would provide a good foundation for them to work from, and the rivalry between Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 owners echoed those rivalries of Sega and Nintendo from the 8 and 16-bit eras. And what about the games? Sure, there'd been many a great game, and also some great franchises. Konami gave the world the amazing Metal Gear Solid, a game developed by Hideo Kojima. This series was a game remembered more for its Hollywood production values and lengthy cutscenes that kept the player up to speed with the story. Each one released was hailed as a groundbreaker, and they all became instant classics. Capcom continued the survival horror theme with yet more Resident Evil games. But these became depressing after number 3, and seemed to provide more action than horror. But the franchises started to rediscover its roots with Resident Evil 7, and with Resident Evil 8, the series looks to be in safe, but scary hands. Core Design also released follow-ups to Tomb Raider, but these ultimately suffered from overexposure, as the ambitious schedule from IDOS, which was to release one every year, is probably far too many. Squaresoft, hot on the heels of the success of Final Fantasy VII, released more volumes of the game to much acclaim and success. And even though I did buy those games, the genie was out of the bottle for me, and they could not recreate the feel of Final Fantasy VII. Sony finally finished Gran Turismo after several years in development, but was it worth the wait? As much enjoyment as the game provided, it did only introduce a few new elements to the racing genre that had not been seen before. DMA Designs after many lawsuits and court appearances, was able to realise their true vision of Grand Theft Auto by releasing a fully 3D version on the PlayStation 2, which broke all sorts of records and became one of the biggest selling franchises in the history of video games. Moving through the generations of consoles, Sony introduced the world to the God of War trilogy, and Microsoft gave us the Gears of War and Halo series, all of which were highly praised and all were excellent games in their own rights. When Sony released the PlayStation 3 after Microsoft released the Xbox 360, they had finally found some competition for Marketplace. But with releases of great franchises such as Uncharted, and a continuation of established franchises like Gran Turismo and Metal Gear Solid, they did eventually assert dominance over Microsoft, but not Nintendo. So what was the problem then? How come video games became something I did when I had time, as opposed to making time for them? And where were all the original ideas now? What happened to the innovation? When I would walk into an arcade in the 1980s and early 90s, it was like a journey of discovery. You never knew what to expect, what the next big thing would be, and if that big thing would make its way to the home console of your choice. Nowadays, Arcades are full of party games like Dance Dance Revolution, or Fruit Machines and Gambling Machines. Very few pioneers are left in the industry, and things certainly look a lot different than they did in the 90s. 
or maybe it's not that the scenery has changed, it's the person within that scene. When I was growing up, video games were a massive part of my life, it would be all I ever thought about at times. Now, as an adult, other things start to demand more of your time, and the time you have for video games seems to get ever more diminished. And maybe the scenery does change too. As a kid, I had my favourite video game stores, places where I would prefer to give my business, and places that seemed to have the latest releases on import ahead of anyone else. Today, those stores are gone. Shut down. Boarded up. Or just moved on with the times. And with it, a part of my childhood as well. Or maybe the fact that software publishers are afraid to try new things for fear of going under. In the 80s, an army of lone bedroom coders would be producing the big hits of the time. Games like Manic Miner and Jet Set Willy. These games made their creators a small fortune, and in the 90s, they disappeared. Fast forward 15 years, and now they are back. Developing games for the mobile gaming sector. Games like Meat Boy and Super Meat Boy, developed over the course of three weeks by two guys barely 20 years old. These guys produced a game that would go on to sell over 1 million copies in its first two years, earn lots of awards, and go on to make them both very wealthy indeed. Not bad for three weeks work. And it just goes to show that video games are a revolution, not an evolution. Trends and ideas keep spinning around. And what about the big software houses? Now software houses have a cast of hundreds, including coders, designers, artists, directors and actors. For those software houses, a bad game could spell financial ruin. So they stick to the sure fire hits and release updated versions every year. FIFA, NBA, NHL, NFL, Call of Duty. These are games that seem to come out on an almost annual basis and have flooded the market. This is a picture of every Call of Duty cover for the last 17 years. But it could as well just be an actual game shelf in your favourite game store right now. For me, this is why I drifted away from video games. I still play video games, don't get me wrong. But now it's more of a hobby and less of a lifestyle. It was not until 2013 that a developer called Naughty Dog released a game that would later be referred to as the Citizen Kane of video games. The Last of Us was a game about a middle-aged man and a teenage girl who survived in a post-pandemic world, scavenging for food and whatever else they could find on their way to a group of freedom fighters in Utah to deliver a cure for the disease. The game itself did not sound particularly amazing, but in story terms and emotion, this was very, very close to Final Fantasy VII. But it had been 16 years since I played a game that was as good and as emotionally moving as this, and it was worth the wait indeed. Since video games first made the step from arcades into the home, games publishers and hardware manufacturers have been treading a fairly rocky path. The MSX and 3DO formats made some attempts at bringing developers together. This is essentially what the PC has been achieving in recent years. Fair to say, the publisher's only safe bet is to do what has been done all along jump on the highest profile bandwagon until the wheels show signs of buckling. Each time someone invents a new box which transforms a TV into a state-of-the-art, 
interactive audio video kit. Gamers will go crazy for it. Everyone else will still want a piece of the action too, once it becomes established and affordable. At this moment in time, Sony have the PlayStation well placed in the UK as the undisputed king of video games. Microsoft's Xbox is keeping the action seekers enthralled. Nintendo are more than holding their own with the Switch and right now it's fair to say that there is no sign of a single format happening. But so what? The world would be a pretty boring place if everybody listened to one style of music from one label. Without the situation where hardware manufacturers are able to say, now look what I can do better, we will have lost a major part of the excitement. The music analogy can be used another way too, in that a games machine boasting a classic game needs never become obsolete. Music streaming is a mass market, but the coolest tracks are often only available on vinyl. People are paying £400 for the privilege of owning a practically antiquated Vextrex in 2021. A PlayStation 5 is state of the art and about the same price if you can get a hold of one. The retro game scene is massive at this point in time. Lots of grown ups buying up old games they couldn't afford as a kid, and even younger generations buying old consoles and games just for the sake of collecting them. All of my video game collection, with the exception of the PC Engine and the Japanese Mega Drive, all the others I have had either since new or when they had an active shelf life. All of the consoles and the games have a story behind them. Great memories of when I purchased them, and how long I would cover them in magazines before I could get my hands on one. This, to me, is what a collector can never have, and it's probably the reason why I very rarely purchase any other games for them now that I am older and can afford to do so. But the retro game scene is crazy at this moment. Some games are changing hands for $1.1 million. Makes me appreciate even more of what I have in my collection, I suppose. As to the way I imagine video games to progress, well, it seems developers are becoming so keen to produce reality, they may be losing sight of the almost psychedelic charm of the originals. When you walk into a video game shop today, the place is full of driving simulators, first person shooters and polygonal fighting games. In 1984, you hardly knew what to expect. This quest for reality is bizarre as well. Sure, the games look nice, but it has or should have always been about the way games play. A few mate of mine at work sit and talk about frame rates, 100 frames per second and amazingly realistic water effects. When I ask them, who does that game play? They look bemused. A game for them is something that looks nice. I could remember playing leaderboard golf in this pool game I had on a Commodore 64 with my dad. And the graphics on those games in 1985 looked terrible compared to now, but all I remember was having a great time playing games with my dad. Even in the early 1990s, publishers were still concerned with making great games and put originality over profit. I used to pay £35 for Mega Drive games, and I remember being able to complete Revenge of Shinobi in about 12 minutes. I paid the same amount of money for Final Fantasy VII in 1997, and it took me 6 months to complete. But after that, games with a 2 hour playtime like Resident Evil seemed so short, but the price never changed. The development costs alone could have justified an increase in price, but the company still had that creative desire as a bedrock of their philosophy. 
This amazing scene, which practically reinvents itself every couple of years, has made it out of the bedroom and into the hippest clubs. Transformed from almost unintelligible blocks and bleeps, to enthralling sights and audiovisuals which rival Hollywood, better than that, remember, the experience is interactive. If the past 30 years have taught me anything, it's that the video games business never stands still. And in 10 years time, or 5 years, or maybe even less, the games that we're playing now will look ridiculous antiques. Some gamers will be saying, OK, so it's old, but Resident Evil 8 is a classic man. I still remember the day it came out. But most of us will have moved on to something immeasurably better. Right now, we can only wonder what that will be. But you can be sure that right now, there is someone sitting in an R&D lab, somewhere in the world, who is working on the game that everyone will be playing in a few years time. Will it be Sony? Nintendo? Microsoft? Will it be a system that has not even come out yet? But we can be assured of one thing, it will be epic. When I began making this series of videos, I felt compelled to do so for a few reasons. The main one being that the so-called millennials talk about games like Call of Duty, Battlefield and Halo as if these are really great games, and I felt sorry for them that the true golden age of video games had passed them by. But then I realised that the golden age of video games will be different for everybody and that while I miss the excitement of walking into arcades and not knowing what to expect, someone else's video game nirvana is to have Call of Duty run at 200 frames per second on a graphics card that costs more than a mortgage repayment. It is different for each person, style and taste. I enjoyed recording my memories of video games at brought back a lot of good times for me, especially the ones where my dad would play games with me on the Commodore 64 and lose intentionally so I would not throw a tantrum. These are the memories that somehow seem to sit in the back of my mind, but yet came flooding back when looking at old magazines from the era. It is especially hard for me to record them now, as my dad passed away in 2015. But creating this video has also helped me realise even more what a great dad he was and I was truly blessed to have him in my life. So as the continue screen counts down to zero and as I fumble in my pocket for a few more 10ps, it is time to apologise to anyone who may feel annoyed that I did not pay a mention to their favourite game or franchise. And also to say a big thank you to Sega, Nintendo, Capcom, Konami, Squaresoft, Naughty Dog, Santa Monica Studios and Electronic Arts for all the great games over the past 30 years or so. Special mention to Data East for giving me Midnight Resistance and to Commodore for paving my way into the world of video games and also for the Commodore 64. How could I have survived primary school without you? Thank you Video Games World for countless hours of enjoyment and thank you Video Games World for the random access memories.
too late. I've already summoned meteors. <laughs> okay, let's go. Oh, <laughs> 